You should dress like a princess. You should die. (laughs) (laughs) Drop dead, daddy. I hope you trip over your robe and get choked on your necklace. It's Mystery Maniacs. Mystery Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to mystery TV. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, and loonies, and everything else we love, except for the mayor. We don't love the mayor. This week, we're talking about Father Brown, Season 1, Episode 9, The Mayor and the Magician. I'm Mark. I'm Sarah. We got some other stuff to talk about before we dive in, though. Boy, do we ever. We just hit 4 Hundred thousand downloads. That's that's actual downloads from our provider. This is not anything from YouTube. This is just podcast listens. That's so awesome. I'm that's, now granted we've made 1.5 million episodes, but <laughs> uh, we made 221 episodes. Released 221 episodes, which means roughly 1,800 listens per episode on average. That's pretty good. I cannot believe how fantastically successful we've become (laughs) and i don't really care if anybody else looks down their nose and says well you don't have a big plaque from youtube or i don't care about any of that is that that how they talk we thought five people would listen to this (laughs) and the fact like this week alone and we'll get to how crazy (laughs) this week has been we have touched so many people's lives. And they've it's touched ours. Absolutely fantastic. And none of them inappropriately or anything yes. like that. And made <laughs> it's been great. Made our lives so much better. Thanks for listening, everybody. Absolutely. We appreciate you. Yep. We started watching Father Brown season eleven this week. Yes. It's pretty good. It's it it is Father Brown. It's Father Brown. If you Brown, like Father Brown, you'll like it. It's late Father Brown. Yeah. Like there's a period of late Father Brown and late Murdoch, which also uh, starts season 17 this month on Acorn. That there's definitely a turn to a bit more kind of goofiness. Yeah. Which is not They a got problem. nothing to lose now. It's nothing to lose. It's absolutely fine. Hey, Sister Boniface shows up in a recent, in yep. one of the fo- season 11 episodes. There's so many horrific things on TV. Why don't you watch something that's nice? Yeah, it is nice. Speaking it's not of the Larkins, horrific, but it's nice. We're, we're still watching True Detective and love every minute of it. <laughs> but wow, it's a bit soul sucking. After, after we watch it, we were like, okay, five minutes of YouTube, yes. something funny. Let's, let's puppies, and now okay, now we can go. Let's to bed. look at hippos yawning. <laughs> Oh, and the um, February newsletter is about to come out on the 7th. Yes. That's the only, well, it's the first place where you're going to see what our schedule is going forward, what we're going to cover. Yes. Sure, we'll mention it on the show for sure. But if you want to know before everybody else, you need to subscribe. We're now to the almost currently through my first quarter of being restful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can tell you've been really taking it easy. Second quarter, I got lots to do. So. Uh, um, and, uh, oh, we forgot, um, Murdoch season 17 is coming out on Acorn in a couple of weeks. Yep. And we talked about what's the plural, all that good stuff. Boy, did we get an interesting message this week from an individual named Bunny Galore. Okay. Just to be fair, this is a maniac podcast. We should not be surprised that maniacs reach out to us. Yes. And Bunny Galore. The best kind of maniac. Is a fantastic maniac. Bunny Galore is in Dress to Kill, season 23, episode four of Midsummer, which is the, the drag show episode. If you remember the scene where they're outside um, and a, a drag queen walks by looking fabulous and behind her, a woman sitting down gets slapped in the face by a flyer <laughs> going at Mach 10 in the wind. That drag queen who walked by looking fabulous is Bunny Galore. Who now says she can't not unsee that. That part lady of getting the slapped by the flyer. She's uh, also in the opening credits, right? Yeah, the, they filmed a bunch of B roll with her and she didn't know why. And then she's like in the title credits and she was completely overwhelmed by that. Because she left us a comment and 
said how much fun it was and that she had a great time and everybody was wonderful. And so on top of being in Midsummer, she also has a, a podcast with a, another drag queen named Allison called Hotel Horror Motel. Sorry. And then she also has done nine seasons of a show on uh, basically like uh, pay-per-view called Movie Nightmares. Oh. which <laughs> And and Britain's Got Talent. This lady is spectacular. So shout out to Bunny Galore. You're awesome. So we're, I think we're going to probably do a short little interview with her. Hopefully. With, uh, yeah. with some experiences. She said that that looked pretty probable. And then uh, we got a text from her from last night. So this would have been... Friday night in the UK. Uh, and she was out doing a benefit and uh, ran into Felix Kai, who was in that episode, and they discussed the podcast. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and I feel awesome. <laughs> Go, Bonnie. It's your birthday. Yes. So, then, so Bunny uh, may be making a, a short appearance. We'll have to do future. a video for that. Yes, we'll have to do a video for that. And... Uh, one last thing about things to come. We have a plan for episode 200 because this is episode 193. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'll let you know more about that as we get it's closer gonna to. It's going to be awesome. Should be fun. I can't believe 200 episodes. That's I can. insane. <laughs> I can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, but now uh, we have to get serious. Speaking of maniacs and, and our and community serious. of maniacs, who are all awesome. Torrid Beater posted on the mystery. This is this is the username. Yes, Torrid Beater on Reddit. Posted on Reddit <laughs> that we had almost killed him <laughs> in a hot tub, listening to Mystery Maniacs. Fell asleep. <laughs> and almost drowned. And almost drowned. <laughs> because the bell system that they use with their wife didn't work. I guess his I, wife rang a bell and he was, they were supposed to ring the bell back and didn't. And so she came running and <laughs> saved his life. <laughs> I, I don't understand people who fall asleep listening to us. I think we're just too exciting to fall asleep to. I can't fall asleep listening to us. <laughs> However, <laughs> this was a novel thing for us. We'd never had somebody almost die while listening to our podcast. Uh, so we have consulted with our maniac lawyers. Of uh, the maniac law firm, Maniac, Maniac, and Maniac. Yeah, LLC. Yep. Um, and uh, we were advised to read the following maniac statement. This podcast is not responsible for any injuries, damages, or losses that may result from listening to the podcast or following any of the suggestions or recommendations made by the hosts. The podcast is especially not liable for any deaths that may occur in ways similar to the victims in the murder TV shows discussed in the podcast. If you or someone you know is in danger of being murdered in a cozy British way, please contact the appropriate authorities immediately. Listener discretion is advised, especially if you are being stabbed with a knitting needle, poisoned with a scone, strangled with a scarf, impaled on a pitchfork, tumbled in a dryer, boiled in a hot tub, crushed by modern art, smashed by cheese, covered in honey, suffocated in a glass globe, or shrink-wrapped. In these cases, please scream and run away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that the lawyers could draft that for yeah. us. That was that was great of them. I'm it sure we paid neat. them a lot of money. It was neat how it speeded up there at the end. <laughs> well, those lists get so long, yeah, you know, you got to cover everything. It's like side effects. Yeah, on, on um, prescription ads. Yes. <laughs> this drug may cause your head to shrink and your eyeballs to fall out and your ears to go numb. And possible side effects are death. Yeah, <laughs> may include death. Wow. <laughs> That's not a side effect of this podcast. And if no. it is, we are not responsible no. for it. <laughs> so, Father Brown, episode nine, season one, The Mayor and the Magician. Only because they couldn't call it The Asshole and the Magician. Which is what they should have called it. <laughs> Epic Asshole and the Magician. Deserve to Die and the Magician, <laughs> season one. Original air date, 24 January 2013. That seems like so long ago. 10 years. 11 years. 11 years ago. <gasps> uh, Dominic Keevy directed this and written by Nicola Wilson. Said asshole may or may look familiar to you because he's played by Sam Crane, who is in season five, episode four of Midsummer, Murder on St. Mally's Day. He plays a somewhat big role in that episode. Does he get killed by the giant spoon? <laughs> <laughs> Back him with the spoon. Spoon, spoon man. man. Um, so the mayor is an idiot. He's more than an idiot. And then, like, at first, 
the, you just think he's the, dumb and his wife writes his speeches? And at at first, she's there in her underwear. So I think you're supposed to think that she is kind of like, oh, I'm the mayor's wife. But then you quickly realize that she's like, oh, no, I run this. Gig. I'm the brains behind the jerk. No, it's more than brains. She's the whole impetus behind she it. She should be the mayor. Yeah. And let me clarify something since you're a dude. The reason why she's sitting around in her slip is not because she's Latida, but because women often do that when they're about to put on something that's semi-formal because you put your dress on at the last minute Yeah. because they're uncomfortable or you'll mess them up or you'll wrinkle them. And so you have it ready. Like anybody who's ever gone to prom or any kind of formal, that's yeah. what you do. You put it on at the last minute and then walk out the door. Well, then the they find the piece of jewelry under the bed and she knows it's up. She tries to cover for him. Yeah. Oh, I've been looking for that. Yes. So their daughter, Kathleen. Yes. He says, have you finished your chores? And she says, yes. And I found this. So is one of her chores to clean under their bed? I did not want to go under my parents' bed. No. Well, I don't want to go under anybody's bed because no. there's it's just Dust Bunnyville under there yeah. at the best. Yeah. But that's one of her jobs? I don't think so. Seems Clean your own weird. room. It seems weird. They're an unpleasant family. <laughs> Mostly due to him. Yes. <laughs> He's so awful. <laughs> He's got his regalia on. I, uh, Mayors in the UK get to wear such awesome duds. They do. He, d he, he should have a hat on. He, he has a tricorn oh, he hat. Oh, does. He does have the tricorn hat. He takes it off to give the speech, which doesn't make any sense, but he's got it on in the living room. In Canada, the mayor wears the necklace, but that's it. That's a blingy the, necklace that they all have. super bling necklace. But he's got the red robes with the fur edging, and he's the mayor of Kimbleford. Like I'm so he should probably just be wearing like a burlap sack or something. Yeah. <laughs> I it's mean, weird. Come on. It's weird. It's like he's the mayor of Midsummer, but that's a county, but Kimbleford's a village in it. It's weird. Yeah, I don't I don't understand how he was elected mayor and doesn't know anybody and nobody knows him. Yeah. It seems awful. If he was weird. an MP, I would understand. Yes. Because MPs are often not really more from sense. where they run. Yeah. But like their family has a seat there, so they Something. run for MP. Yeah. Even if he's the mayor of the equivalent of the county that Kimbleford is in, he would still have gone there to campaign. You would think. And Father Brown would be somebody you definitely want to make touch with because he knows everybody. And like he is. He's so completely unaware how he much he needs her because... No, he doesn't care. Well... She's utterly taken for granted. She's a piece of furniture yep. who, who does things for him that he expects her to do. And she got him elected and he doesn't even understand that. No. They're having a fate yes. to raise money. The to goldfish build. can't be south facing. What? They're <laughs> in a round pergola. Uh, all you fish face that way to raise money to build a school in the Polish refugee camp. Which makes sense. It makes sense. And Except it, that's not at all what the mayor is trying to do with that money. Yes. And knows really nothing about that. Yes. I always feel so bad for Susie. Well, uh, did you look up uh, Faworki? Yes. They're deep fried pastries with powdered sugar and they look totally tasty. Yes, please. Yes. I was like, <laughs> I would eat all of those. They they almost look like elephant ear no, strips. They're tentacles with exotic causes. Tentacles of Leviathan. <laughs> I tried to find a recipe for something called Tentacles of Leviathan and there isn't anything out there. So I think I might have to come up with a new recipe. <laughs> but Father Mrs. M's Tentacles of Leviathan. <laughs> Maybe that's the recipe we should put in the newsletter. <laughs> he's cheating on his wife. He has tantrums and throws glasses. He's rude to his child. He's too stupid to write his own speeches. He's having an affair with his assistant. He gives Who her the, he demand he gets pregnant and demands that she gets an abortion. In some back alley. Clearly doesn't pay for it. Gives her the necklace and fires her. Criticizes his daughter for dressing like a pirate. Tells her she's ugly. I mean, there is nothing redeeming about no. him. At all. There are several points in my notes where I go, can I kill the mayor? 
can everybody kill the mayor? Yes. When he opens his speech and sees it's not his speech, but it's a, a note from his wife that says goodbye. Yes. I'm like, yes, you go, girl. That's the best part. And then he has no idea what to say. He's like oh, a bumbling It is moron. the worst political speech ever. How does he have conversations with people? I don't know. Without notes? No. It's so weird. Father Brown, though, is getting the humbugs ready. <laughs> so they must be having a competition where you guess how many humbugs are in the jar. Is it the same jar as the goldfish? <laughs> yeah. But he's putting half of them in his mouth. He's going to look like a chipmunk. And he keeps touching all, he's touching all of them. I like, know. Like, why don't you buy a bag that says 500 humbugs? They never say that. They just have weight. No. Oh. That's how it works. But wouldn't you have done that in advance? That's like something you could do the day before and have ready. I just was like, your hands will be so sticky. So sticky. (laughs) You should dress like a princess. You should die. (laughs) (laughs) Drop dead, daddy. I hope you trip over your robe and get choked on your necklace. So when they meet Edwin, who is the man in the village who had also run for mayor and not won, he's wearing a poppy. Yes, a white poppy. A white poppy. I had never seen a white poppy before. So I looked it up and it's it it basically means the same thing as a red poppy except it's a commitment for of to peace and it commemorates both civilian and military who died in the war. Yeah, and it's interesting that there is a tiny thread underneath everything that he didn't go to the war because he didn't want to. Mm-hmm. He was a conscientious objector. And that's why right? he has a white poppy. Which I absolutely respect and understand. Mm -hmm. But then it's also implied that the mayor got out of going to the war. Of course he did, because he's a jerk. Yeah. Everything about him is bad. So you have both of those kind of situations that must have lingered into the 50s in in the UK. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. I think there was a... people in half, like my dad. (laughs) Show me how to kill him. That's the mayor of the title. Yes. Then there is the magician of the title, which I think is a, the more interesting plot of this episode. Oh, I do The too. murder really isn't, at, and mostly because I don't care if he's dead. I wish his head had exploded as he got electrocuted, but he didn't. Um, that's a little much, but he's just that bad. But the magician is the Mrs. M plot. But he is as bad. He is, it is more toxic masculinity oh, yeah. on display because as soon as she refuses him, he calls her a nag. Yeah. Like th- the episode is, here's some toxic masculinity from the 50s. Yeah, basically. <laughs> but, you know, leading up to this point, and we've talked about this a lot, Mrs. M's character evolves. But prior to this, she has basically just been a big pain in the butt. She is a nag. She's She assumes the worst of everybody. She's a little racist. It, it, she's, she's not always as benevolent as she could be to people. And to see her vulnerable like this, because Frank is her husband. Yes. Right? He, she thought he was dead in the war. He never came home. And he had run off with a younger woman anyway. Yeah. He didn't die. He shacked up with somebody else. And now he's sick and dying of cirrhosis of the liver. So he's going to show up for Mrs. M to take care of him in the last six months of his life. Yeah. And she says, no, thank you. No, no. And the relationship between her and Lady F becomes what it's meant to be here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we really, this is the first time we see Mrs. M remotely vulnerable. Yeah, She's absolutely. sad. She she tears up. Yeah. And we see that he's charming mm-hmm. and that she understands and relates to that charm. But as soon as he crosses a line, she's... Well, he's not charming enough. Yeah, he's not charming. To overcome what he's done, right? That, to me, is much more interesting than the murder. Though, Valentine, in classic Valentine fashion, just arrests the first person that he could suspect and drags them away. He just drags Eleanor away in handcuffs. Basically just leaves her daughter to fend for herself. You know, somebody will look after her. Because there's a pickpocket around, too. (laughs) (laughs) Which is Kathleen, the little girl. When the magician uh, leans against the truck, did you see that there was an address on Mm -hmm. the truck? Did you go to see what that was? I knew you would. It, it's the Meldon Social Club. Oh. So I don't know why they had a truck there. I guess probably for like they do these fit fets mm-hmm. and uh, 
that's why the address was there. But it, it eighty Meldon P- Terrace, Heaton, Newcastle on Tyne. Well, if they're a social club, maybe they have like an old time fire truck or something that maybe. they take to fa- fairs and show off. Why does uh, Frank hide from Mrs. M at first if he's trying to get her back? Because he's smart enough to know that he needs to reconnect with her in the right circumstances. Mm. Yeah, I could see that. Why does Kathleen say to him when he's crouched down suffering, it'll cost you? He says, get help. And she says, it'll cost you. Because she... She's so desperate for money to run away that yeah. she's even willing to let somebody suffer. I think that's it. <laughs> That's pretty bad. I want to feel sympathy for that little girl. and But when she does that, I'm like, wait a minute. You're as bad as your dad. What have you well, learned? that's what she's been taught. Yeah. I also think she's a really good child actor. She, does she is. Really she's very good. good here. Yeah, she does a great job. But then Eleanor sort of snaps. Yeah. <laughs> when she's throwing those balls at those plates, number one, she's a really good arm. Yeah. She hits every one of them. But... I don't know if she's just in shock or shock slash free and giddy about it. Well, like, I think I think that she... I didn't get a chance to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> she has spent her whole life propping this person up mm. and has been sort of... Well, she's been made aware of his infidelities mm-hmm. in the same afternoon. Yeah. She's having a very bad, a bad day. day. Yeah. And now he's dead. And I have to think that she also feels a weird kind of guilt because she may have wanted him dead. She, and then he's dead and she knows that she didn't do it. Yeah. But she's worried. Not that I don't think she mentally is aware that I think she's mentally aware that she didn't cause his death. Mm-hmm. But you know how when you have bad feelings about kind of like Kathleen, yeah. she confesses that she wanted her dad dead so she thinks he died because she wanted him dead. Yes. But she might also be angry because she had orchestrated his embarrassing downfall. Yes. Right? She swapped the speeches and she knows Edwin is going to stand up and confront him and and shame him. And she's ready to go the press. Like she has plans. And leave him. That are screwed. But now he's dead so she can't do any of that. So there's no revenge. Yeah. She can't get the revenge. It's almost like by dying, he gets away with it all. Yeah. So I think she might be a little bit angry about that. Father Brown goes to the pub to talk to Edwin because we find out the reason he withdrew from the mayoral race is because he has a criminal record. Yes. For GBH. Right? Which. Grievous bodily harm. There, there needs to be a thing in, well, really anywhere that says, it's like a parenthesis after your crime that says, but it was a Nazi. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have. Grand Theft Auto. But it was a Nazi. You know, if you commit a crime and some element was also racist, it's like a a, a, a variable that they add to it, yes. right? They should have the opposite of that, where it's like, you did that, but they were Nazis. It's extenuating circumstances, you know? But he was an asshole mayor. So, mm, was it really manslaughter? Ah, I don't know. <laughs> it's asshole slaughter. I don't think that counts. Yeah, like, that, they... Make him so horrible <laughs> that I'm surprised they don't make him a Nazi. Yeah, really? <laughs> He's so bad, that wouldn't even make him worse. Like, you would just go, of course he is. Yes. You would absolutely expect it. Oh, when he says that line, when they meet Father Brown and Mrs. M for the first time, and Father Brown says that Kathleen is spirited and has an inquisitive mind. He says those may be good traits in a man, but in a woman, they're tiresome or something like that. I just want to, I just want Mrs. M to just shoot her hand out and just slap it. Again, it's GBH, (laughs) but it was the mayor. Yeah, so it's okay. So So he, he goes to the pub. Yes. And plays darts with Edwin. So this is like Father Brown is almost comic relief in this episode. Yeah, I agree. And and that's okay because we've we've known that this show is created by a strong group of women creators, right? June Tyndall being part of this group, but but there are a number of women associated with this show. And it really, I would say, becomes that sort of birth of women in in the 50s in Europe, Mm -hmm. right? So I don't mind 
And I don't think Mark Williams would get upset that he's kind of comic relief for this episode. No, not at all. <laughs> he's like, he's investigating. <laughs> They're like, uh, <laughs> we're doing stuff over here. He's well, like, I'm investigating a murder. <laughs> and really, do you need to investigate this no, murder? I no. mean, come on, you know, I mean, you don't want her to go to prison and no. be hanged, but yeah, I mean, it was the mayor. So they go to the pub. <laughs> you want to play darts? And All the village guys people get up and run away. <laughs> run away, right away. <laughs> <laughs> and you know something's up. Uh-oh, Father Brown's going to play darts. Run for your lives! But Mark Williams does such a good job of physical comedy. Yes. He actually looks like he's trying. He looks like he's trying. <laughs> but he does not hit the dartboard once. No. And hits a table at least once. And Edwin doesn't say, like, wow, you're really bad at this. He just keeps on playing like nothing's happening. I think they've all played darts. <laughs> you sort of want a scene where you see Father Brown throw the dart, but you don't see where it lands, and you just hear like a little yell off se- off screen, you know. Yes. Ow! I bet they did 10 or 12 of those, and they picked the best ones. The worst ones? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the ones that work the best. What else would he be bad at? Like Cricket. Why is he so bad at darts? I don't know. Uh, well, he's so bad at darts because he's thinking about other things. You the, think? Yeah. He just doesn't lack hand-eye coordination. I worry about him lawn bowling. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. M, true. get out of the way. He's playing some bocce ball and knocking people <laughs> out. I would not trust him with a cricket bat. No. <laughs> Certainly not lawn darts. <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe it's his eyesight. It could be. He, he reads and rides well, a bike, Well, it's the though, sticky so. hands. <laughs> yeah, from all the humbugs. Yes. He can't get them. He th- tries to throw the dart and it stays in his hand. Yes. I love, I don't think they mean it as a joke, but Father Brown's asking Edwin questions while they play darts. And Edwin says, I don't appreciate playing games. <laughs> while he's playing darts. While he's playing darts. <laughs> yeah. Though with Father Brown, it's not really a game. It's kind of survival. Of course, the writer of this episode is screaming at their podcast player going, finally, somebody got that joke. <laughs> Kathleen has run away to talk to a friend. Her mother says, she doesn't have any friends. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. I know you're getting arrested and everything, but you know, scream that in the street. I mean, She's can had you a... imagine if you were Kathleen's friend? Come over to my house and play. Is your dad going to be there? Then I'm not coming. You didn't have friends that you didn't go over when their dads were there? No. Oh, we. D- I definitely did. Because <laughs> their dads were so awful? Yeah. I didn't know it was such a thing. Yeah, it was for me. And then my two best friends only had... It was really a girlfriend thing for me. My girlfriend in high school's father was just a horrible human being. Mm. So, so you, you didn't want to go hang out at her house anyway. No, plus he was a cop and had a gun, so. Oh, boyfriends usually stay away from dads yeah. with guns. But my two best friends were from single moms, so I preferred it that way. Which is weird because my dad, this is one of those examples where my dad is fantastic. He was a great guy. He was great to other people in the community. You know, he he was, I'd never heard him raise his voice to my mother. I, like, I was... So you had an example of a good dad. In the, so you knew what a bad dad looked in like. In a world of toxic man- masculinity, my father just kind of shook his head and said, I'm not doing any of that. I just can't imagine being Kathleen's friend and going over and meeting him for the first time. You'd probably walk in the door and go, oh, hello, m- you know, Mr. Knight. And he'd go, well, you're ugly. Yeah, probably. Oh, thanks. We'll um, go play now. <laughs> my husband's favorite joke is just horrific like oh. just in case you are going to have it hit over your head a little bit more that's it yeah in case there was any doubt how bad he was here's your example yeah and valentine doesn't even get it yeah valentine valentine's a pretty open-minded dude but i think they use him here as a i you know he's so involved in the case that he can't see how horrible the mayor is. I would have liked to have seen a scene where Father Brown and him kind of say it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I agree. We cannot underestimate the importance of Mrs. M giving her ring back to Frank. Oh, that's huge. Because she is so devoutly Catholic and she's been wearing it all this time. He's got one on too. He, so he probably put his on before coming to see her. He, She basically says to me, in the eyes of God, our marriage is annulled. Yeah, and that's huge. Yeah. 
for somebody as devout as she is. Absolutely. Good riddance. There's a ref- I don't care if he's yeah. dying. There's a reference to Winston Churchill here. Did you get that? Mm-mm. So when Susie's writing the letter to her MP, mm-hmm. she's writing it to Winston Churchill. He wouldn't have been an MP at no, this point. No, it was weird. Well, maybe... He got he got called up for, for yibby-jibby. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Winston Churchill is the most prominent politician she knows. Yeah, I think that's... And she would think that he would be on her side because, you know, he won the war. Ugh. When Matilda tells Father Brown about the baby and, oh, I just feel so bad for her. Yeah. Just, <laughs> why did you fall for this horrible man? I mean, really, her and Eleanor ought to be friends. Like, wow, I don't, we're both broken in the same way. We should stick together. He's miss- Except she's going to go to prison he, and He's stuff. missing a charming bit. Yeah, there's, there's nothing about him that I think she would have seen and went, well, I know he's got all those bad sides, but, you know, he flatters me or... Right, so these relationships are of blinders, right? So if you saw Frank doing the magic show with the little girl with you'd, blinders on, you would think, oh, he's, he's a charming. sweet old yeah. grandpa guy, right? So there has to be blinder points in these relationships. But we don't see that with the mayor. No. He's horrible from the very beginning. From every view. Now... <laughs> There's no, the blinders would have to be a helmet. Now, a you, back over your you head. could say he's having a bad day because he knows he's been found out and he's mad. He doesn't know that from the beginning. No, he doesn't know that from the beginning. It, it would have been nice to have some scene where he tried to be charming to one of these women mm-hmm. and it failed. It still failed, but like Frank fails with Mrs. M. Yeah. One thing I really like about the Mrs. M thing is that Lady Felicia comes back and says, I was wrong. Yeah. Sorry I was being nosy. It wasn't any of my business. She means it. Yep. But Lady Felicia, it would be anachronistic. But when she comes into that kitchen to talk about the land that the government needs to be able to build that power plant and how they're not going to get it, she should snap her fingers. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) They need this area. They're not going to get it. My husband is too influential to make us sell it. No, no, no. (laughs) And like, of course, there's all sorts of double standards here. Like Lady Felicia is, she sleeps around with men a lot. Mm -hmm. And it is implied that everybody knows this. And her husband has affairs too. Yeah. They don't have that kind of relationship. But, but they're... But they're not the mayor. <laughs> no. I would like Monty may be horrible she as a pre- husband. She doesn't pretend to be anything other than who she is. Yeah. And I don't think he does either. I I think Monty would still be good in a fight, like good to help you. I think he would stand up for her. Yeah, absolutely. He provides for her. Yeah. Yeah. They're not dishonest with each other. But man, when she wants to pull some strings, she gets her gloves out and grabs the ropes. <laughs> I got it taken care of. Like an hour has gone by and that problem is gone. Yeah. Don't worry about it, Susie. It's it's fine. Yeah. Go make some more angel hair things so we can eat them all. So we find out that Kathleen used her hair curler because she was an electrician in the war. Mm Mm-hmm. Wait, but wait a minute. I don't think that's a hair curler. I just think Kathleen doesn't know what a soldering iron looks like. Yes, I think you're right. It's a soldering iron because it ends in a tip. Yeah. In a point, not in a handle. So I think it's a soldering iron all along. I think so. Yeah. So I looked into the history of curling irons because I hadn't done that. Because you wanted to know where they come from? So they're actually far older than you realize. Oh, they used to just be iron and you'd put them in the fire and heat them. And then yeah. you'd put them on your hair and they would burn your hair off. They they became uh, mechanized in the Victorian age mm-hmm. in terms of uh, they were allowed to, they, they had handles instead of just raw metal that you put in the fire. They used to be tongs. They, and they used to be tongs. And there are still some out there that are like that. And they used to come in sets. Yeah. Right? Because you would warm one up while the other one was cooling. Yeah. The one interesting thing I thought I I did read about was a really good blog post about how it was a thing about class and race during the Victorian period, too. The Mm -hmm. notion of straight hair, Mm -hmm. especially for African-American women, was somewhat of a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that... Because they didn't have chemical relaxers then. You had to do it with heat, and you had to do it every day. Yeah. 
And and it damaged your hair. Damaged your and hair. And took a lot of time. And you were putting something hot from the fire on your head. Yep. Like It was dangerous. You absolutely got dangerous. And then I made the mistake of looking about up uh, people who got killed by hair curlers and never looked that up. <laughs> Did they get electrocuted or burned? No, or? no. It's, uh, it's bad, huh? Okay, I'm glad you have that Google history, not me then. Yeah, Ooh, it's not good. <laughs> As somebody who uses a curling iron every day, I can tell you they're dangerous. Yeah. If you, my straightener, if you put somebody's fingers between them, it'd be like a panini sandwich fingers <laughs> real fast. <laughs> but yeah. So I, the logistics of this are really impossible. So Matilda goes into the tent where the speaker system is hooked up, right? Unscrews the back. So she carries a screwdriver too. Unscrew, she's ready to go. She's like MacGyver secretary. Unscrews the back of the, the system. Yeah. Knows where to disconnect things and solder them back yep. to make the mic live. Yeah. Without electrocuting anything in between. Or Keep working up to it. I got it ready. Or shorting anything out. Yep. It doesn't kill him right away. Yep. So I don't know how that works. That's not how but any of this works. A soldering <laughs> iron is really, uh, it's really hot and it stays hot for a long time. Like the one I have, I would let it cool for half an hour before I would touch it because they yeah. get hot enough to melt metal. Yes. That's much hotter than a curling iron. Also, where did she store her solder? Solder comes in a little spool. It's easy. I guess. But I don't know why she would have had any with her. Yeah. Or her soldering iron. Like, how big is her purse? So she came to the house to drive them mm -hmm. and she gets fired. Mm -hmm. And so that's the inciting incident for her to- But she has no time to go, wait a minute, I got to go grab some stuff. Yeah. It's it's weird. <laughs> it gets her tool bag. She needed it needed to be like I know he needed to be making that horrible speech, but almost it should have been. And he stomps off and then ends up dead, mm. like stabbed or something. Or at least the event is the next day. Or like some, he fires yeah. her the night before. Yeah. And then the next day she shows up to drive them, and so she's thought about it all night and come prepared to take him out. I guess, but this is not how any of this works like electricity <laughs> or microphones mm. or loudspeakers. No, or no, none of it. No, hard it, conditions. It's also not the first time we've seen somebody electrocuted with a microphone. Uh, no, uh, the axe man cometh in axe midsummer. Axe man cometh in midsummer. I'm really glad. Well, the axe man cometh. At least they had a big cord that was plugged into the mains, and there were some sparks. There was some sparks and stuff like that. This is not how any of this works. And his hair I'm should have been smoking. Really glad that he didn't touch the microphone, and it went. Ah. It does a little bit. And a little bit. Well, if he didn't put his tongue on it, he probably would have lived. So <laughs> if you hate him now, wait until you find out that she not only had an abortion for him, but also is now unable to have children. Mm -hmm. Her entire life is ruined. Yep. And I think she's a good secretary. I, I, I think so. And I think she would know that she was being propped up he was being propped up by his wife mm -hmm. but she's deluded she'd think he would leave her for no come on he's a yeah. jerk Ugh. this episode jerks and darts <laughs> i guess <laughs> that's the name that's it that's jerk marin darts jerks and darts but mrs m gets a fish Yes, she does. <laughs> and I'm like, like that's going to solve everything. I think it's, well, he goes in. He's going to talk to her. Yeah. They're going to spend some time. Because they got to set up the fish. Yeah. They really are best friends, Father Brown and Mrs. M. They are. And like, we don't need to see that Father Brown does the same thing that Mrs. That Lady Felicia says does. We need to see Lady Felicia do it. Mm -hmm. Well, she brings the flowers. She yeah. tries. Yeah. And Mrs. M and she have a lot more history. So yeah. it's not going to be a one move forgiveness. Everything's okay. It's going to take a couple, you know. No, but Mrs. I, like, M's awfully proud. I like that she uses Lady Felicia's words against Frank. Mm -hmm. She's like, this person believes in me. So I'm going to believe in me. Yep. It so helps. you need to get out of here, Frank. And I love that he's, he does that. 
horrible man thing of, well, I'm going to die, so I have to fix everything now. No, that's not even it. Yeah. I'm going to die, so I've come here so you can take care of me. Yeah. That's what he's doing. Yeah, that's true. You're my old fallback, reliable, you know, pushover. I, I knew I could rely on you to take care of me. Well, no, you can't. What's Mrs. M going to name her fish? Hmm. Ophelia. I think it's going to be a biblical name. That's true. Like St. Thomas the Goldfish or something. <laughs> Whoever the patron saint of fish is. <laughs> That's what she's going to name it. And then it's going to be back to that conversation about bad dog names. You can't, some names you just can't call a fish. And I, I like I like how they deal with toxic manual, masculinity here in its many forms. Mm -hmm. Like Frank puts up resistance, but when she says go, he goes. Yeah. Like he can still be toxic, but still agree that maybe he should go. Take your hat and go, Frank. Yep. Don't care if you dance. We can't even talk about best corpse because there's only one. Yes. And he's the best because he's dead. He's not the best corpse. He's the worst corpse. He's that makes him the best. Yeah. <laughs> he's the one corpse we're glad to have. Yay. Yay. Like, it's a trope in all these shows about the horrible person being killed. Mm -hmm. Like, this show start like, episode one, the hammer of God has one of the worst human beings yes. in it. Right. <laughs> He's absolutely horrible. The mayor challenges that. Yeah, in, in an asshole competition, I'm not sure which of them would win. And I'm, I'm like, why are there so many assholes in this, <laughs> in this little village? <laughs> what happens after this? Because she, even though she's the mayor's widow, it's sad, but she doesn't have any credibility or anything. I hope she raises Kathleen to be, a, not Kathleen, raises her daughter to be yeah, an astronaut. Yeah, it is Kathleen. Kathleen to be an astronaut. Or I don't know. I think um, Eleanor and Edwin are actually friends because they teamed up to That's true. put together this plan and they seem to have similar values and well, maybe they'll end up together. Or friends, at least. She's not alone. What happens to the young lady who killed him? She goes to prison. Or hangs. And probably hangs, because he was important and a man. Yeah. And she was a jilted other woman. It's unfortunate. The trial's going to be nasty. I feel bad for Eleanor for the trial and Kathleen for the trial. Because there, it's going to, I mean, I guess if she confesses, there won't be a trial. But. Again, I know it's only an hour, but I, Valentine forgetting to handcuff her or something. Wouldn't be. Wouldn't I don't be think horrible. she'd run away, though. No. Because I think she did it because she felt like her life was over and she had nothing to lose. I she agree. basically says as much. Yes. You know? Wow. What a, a f fun note to end this episode well, on. Well, in such an episode of toxic masculinity, <laughs> next week. We have Flambeau. <laughs> he's not toxic. He's sexy. He's so sexy and charming. And then later, him and Lady Felicia, they do the kissy kiss and <laughs> stuff. And you don't even care that she's married because it's Flambeau and they're kissing. It's Flambeau. <laughs> See, he's perfect in that he is charming to everybody. Yeah, oh, yeah. He's, he's dastardly. He, he runs on, I'm a thief. But I've got a heart of gold. Yeah. And I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm charming while I pick your pocket. But I only steal really good stuff, so don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> I only steal from from people who deserve it. Mm, so. Or, you know, artifacts that have a lot of importance. Yeah, he just, you know, he likes bright and shinies. And I got to make a living, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great character, and yes. I get to see him for the first time, so that'll be fun. The Blue Cross, episode 10, season one. Is that the episode where we get to see how the rest of the church sees Father Brown I for the first so. time? <laughs> we get to see his superiors and what they think of him, Yes, which makes you just like him even more. Well, it, it always reminds me, like, I came from a very small parish in Canada, with very small churches, and I wonder what the people who got assigned to our church. Oh, or, great! I'm going or, to that place. What happened? Why they were assigned? <laughs> It'll be fun. It'll be fun. It'll be the last Father Brown of season one, and uh, next week we'll tell you where we're going next too. Or you can subscribe to the newsletter to see where we're going. And you can subscribe to the newsletter from all the social medias, or going to our website. 
it's all on there. So, all right. Until then, bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Thanks for joining us on the Mystery Maniacs podcast. If you enjoyed our crazy podcast today, don't miss out on future episodes. Follow us on social media for updates, behind the scenes content, and exclusive sneak peeks. Subscribe, like, and share to spread the word. Bye, maniacs. I just want Father Brown to look up and his face to be like bowed out like a chipmunk because he's got so many <laughs> in his mouth. So many humbugs in Because every other one he's putting in his yeah. mouth. <laughs> what, I got some candy in my mouth.